Amen. 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 It's so good to be with you guys today. While you're on your feet, I just want to just uh, love on our pastors, Pastor Daniel and Pastor Tammy. We love you so much. We, all of us, wouldn't be right here had you not answered the call of God on your life, been faithful to it. We're thankful for people like you. We love you. We love you. And, and Pastor Donna and Pastor Dennis, we're, we honor you. Thank you for being with us here today. Thanks for making me a little nervous. We love you guys. So glad you're here. Hey, all across this room, you can have a seat every location. Welcome, welcome, welcome. So glad to be with you guys today. Thank you, band. Come on, make some noise for our worship team at every location. We love y'all. Hey, anybody have a, an issue with losing keys? <laughs> You just got here. You really don't know where they are. I, I'm that way. I lose my keys all the time, all the time. And um, I, I just, like, I have the tendency to put them in a pocket or, like, like a shirt pocket or my jeans. And I'll, like, put my jeans in the closet or my jacket away. And then I'm, imagine, you know, I need to leave the next day and I can't find my keys. And I'm always frustrated and it's always my fault. You know, and, and so there's this one year, I remember years back, I was uh, getting ready to leave home on a Sunday morning for Easter Sunday. I was so excited to lead worship. I can't remember um, which year it was specifically, but I remember my son was really young, and it was just going to be an incredible Easter. I was playing Kirk Franklin at the house. Do you want a revolution? I was ready for, for, for church. But as I'm getting ready to leave, I can't find my keys anywhere. So I, I start going into the places that I typically leave them. I leave them in my jacket. I'm searching through my closet. I'm going through the junk drawer. At this point, I'm starting to get a little bit nervous. And I, I'm wondering to myself, like, I need to find these keys because I'm going to be super late. And so, like, I'm, I'm rummaging through the house, opening every drawer, looking in the refrigerator. I've, I've left it there before. And, and, I'm, and I, I then I wake my wife up, and I'm saying, babe, where are the keys? I, I can't find them. And she's like, I don't know. Where did you leave them? Where'd you put them? This place, check the key hook, check this place. And I'm checking everywhere. And I'm telling you at this point, guys, I'm shook. I'm thinking to myself, this is the moment. This is the time. This is the dream that I had. I, I didn't show up for Easter. I getting, I'm getting fired. This is the moment. This is that dream. <laughs> but um, I, the, I had the wherewithal for a moment to say, let me ask my son. <laughs> let me ask Jeremiah. And, um, and, and you're probably too, he's on the front row, you're probably too young to remember this. I walked into his room, and I, I'm shaking him. I'm saying, hey, wake up, buddy. Hey, wake up, wake up. And I'm saying, I asked him, do you know where my keys are? And I remember him rolling over and saying, they're on the red couch. <laughs> and so I immediately run out of his room. I go to the couch, and sure enough, I pull away one pillow. And there my keys are waiting for me. And I realized in that moment, man, I need to make sure I put my keys in the hook. And two, I realized Jeremiah has hid my keys from me. This time it is not my fault. You know, why is that key so important? You know, I, I had something to do that day. I had a place to be. And I, and I realized that that key held a lot of power in my life in that moment. You know, um, I, I think about the, uh, what, what this key right here is the key to my house. I, this little piece of metal, this alone, uh, locks and unlocks things. It, it, it locks and unlocks the door to my house, and it gives me access into um, everything that my house is. It, it gives me access to rest and shelter and safety. My family lives there. It, my possessions, my clothing, I, can, I, can, I get just about everything I need inside that house. You know, it gives me access. You know, when, when, I, when I bought a house... When I, when I went to the, to the office and, and I signed the paperwork and me and my wife closed on the house, they didn't hand me a house. They actually handed me this key. And when they handed me this key, they put something in my hand that I would need. And when you became a child of God, God put a set of keys into your hands. And they are necessary to walk out this life for Jesus. You know, your faith is a key. You know, your, your faith unlocks courage in times of uncertainty. It, it, it unlocks vision when you need it. It, un, it unlocks hope in desperate times. Your faith is a key. You know, your, your, your worship is a key. It unlocks identity when you, don't, when you need a reminder that you are a child of God. It unlocks your confidence uh, when, so that you can know that you serve a great God who's doing great things, who's continuing to do great things in your life. 
It unlocks the manifest presence of God in your life. You know, the Bible says that he inhabits the praises of his people. Your worship is a key that unlocks that. I love, I love worship because it breaks chains off your life and it gives you uh, the ability to experience the freedom that this life has to offer in Jesus. Your worship is a key. We also have been given the key of prayer. And that key, in the hand of a believer, and we're going to focus on this today, has the ability to change things in your life. You know, it's, it changes things because of who it gives you access to. It gives you access to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. God tells us in his word that as we draw near to him, he draws near to us. See, in my house, if my children want something, they don't fuss about it amongst themselves. Well, at least for a little bit they do, but eventually they get the wherewithal to go to the authority, to go to the person who could do something about it. And that's what our prayer does. It gives us access to the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the God of all creation. There are a few things that move heaven on this earth, and prayer is one of them. Charles Spurgeon, the great author and theologian, wrote, prayer is the slender nerve that moves the muscle of omnipotence. Don't you love that? Don't you love that? See, if, if we have a need today, we should pray. If we need deliverance today, we should pray. If you're searching for a breakthrough in your life today, you should pray. When you feel alone, you should pray. You know, prayer is also our weapon in, in spiritual warfare. You see, it is the thing that, also, that causes heaven to rejoice, but it also causes hell to tremble. It causes demons to scatter and flee. It, it confuses the enemy. And that's why I love seasons like this in 21 Days of Prayer, where we get to focus on prayer. We get to, we get to invest in our prayer life because it's going to make a difference in our life. You know, we, we're kind of crowning this year with faith in God. And so, and, and we remember what Second Chronicles says to us, that if my people call by my name, will humble themselves and pray. Things happen when we pray. You know, it's 21 days of prayer as you think about it, because all of you know, it's at 6 a.m., right? It's early. And you're thinking to yourself, that's a little bit too early for me. Uh, praying for an hour, that's more than I typically ever have prayed before. You know, this season is meant to stretch you. And it's also meant to give you time in God's presence. Because it's in that stretching, in that pressing, in that time where something beautiful is created. You know, I, th I, think, about, uh, I think about the olive. It's when it's crushed that the oil pours out. You know, I think about the, the, the grape. It's, it's when it's pressed that the wine begins to flow, and it's the time that it takes in between to create something incredible. You know, think about Jesus and his first miracle at the wedding in Cana and how at the end of the wedding, he brought his first miracle. Could you imagine the people who left the wedding early? <laughs> the, save the best for last. There's something about the stretching and the pressing and the time in that God has a blessing for you on the other side. And so I came to tell somebody today, the best wine is yet to be served. The finest oil is yet to be poured in your life. God has something for you, and you're going to find it in prayer. You're going to find it in prayer. He's going to unlock some things in your life. And I think in, in particular, there's three things that God unlocks through prayer. I'm going to focus on that today. The first thing is I believe God unlocks power. God unlocks power. And now, I don't necessarily mean just the power of God, because every time I open my eyes, I see the power of God on full display. I wake up in the morning, and I take a deep breath. That's the power of God. I walk outside, and I see the sun rising. That's the power of God on display. From the, from the beginning, God spoke creation into being, and ever since then, it's been spinning. It's been sustaining by the power of God. God's power is on full display. God's power is unleashed. I'm talking about the power of you. Prayer unlocks the, the power of you. God has endowed us with power, and prayer is the thing that unlocks it. And what do we need that prayer? What do we need that power for? Every moment. To make a difference in this world. To parent. To, to persevere through challenges and through stretching. Jesus tells us in John 15 that I am the vine and you are the branches. If you remain in me, and I remain in you, you will bear much fruit. 
Apart from me, you can do nothing. Do nothing? You mean absolutely nothing? I mean nothing of spiritual significance. I believe Jesus means things of eternal value. You can do nothing. Because there is going to be some things you face in this life that you're going to need another kind of power for. Nothing of eternal significance happens apart from prayer. Because, you know, there's a lot of people that are doing a lot of things and saying a lot of things that is just noise and an echo chamber. But I'm talking about something that makes a difference. I'm talking about fruit that remains. You need a different kind of power, and it's unlocked in your prayers. It's unlocked in your prayers. Let's go to Matthew chapter 17, verse 14 through 21. And the Bible says, And then they had come to the multitude. A man came to him, kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is an epileptic and suffers severely, for he often falls into the fire and often into the water. So I brought him to your disciples, but they could not cure him. Then Jesus answered and said, faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of him. And the child was cured from that very hour. Then the disciples came to him. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, why could we not cast it out? So Jesus said to them, because of your unbelief, for surely I say to you, if you have the faith as a mustard seed, you will say to the mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. However... This kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. You're going to face some things in this life that are going to need something different. It's going to need a person that's built different. It's going to need a person that prays different. It's going to need to be a, have a person that believes differently. Because this, this thing, that thing you're facing right now is going to come out through prayer and through fasting. You know, why did Jesus call them perverse? Why, why did Jesus call them faithless? You know, there's, there's some times in this life that we go so attached to the things of this world and so unattached to God. And so he gives us the remedy right inside the verse, prayer and fasting. What does prayer do? It draws you closer to God and fasting draws you further away from the world. And that is the recipe for power in your life because we need some power. You know, I, I think about the people in my life that are just, they seem like they have a special power on them. It seems, it seems like superhuman. It seems mystical in some ways. You know, um, it's, it's like that, that grandmother or that church mama or, or that small group leader in your life or that pastor. It just seems like when they say something, things happen. And let me demystify it for just a second. It's not because God has selected something special upon their life. It's because they've been with Jesus. It's because they spend time with God. You know, the Bible t tells us that the disciples were ordinary, unlearned men. They were just blue-collar, regular guys, but the world took notice. Why? Because they had been with Jesus. So have you been with Jesus? Have you been on your face in prayer? Have you been in his presence? Have you lifted your hands in his presence? Have you worshipped him? Have you told him how good he is? Some things in this life are going to need a power that's a little bit different that you can't just muscle your way through, but it's going to be unlocked through your prayers. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, this, the second thing I believe that our prayer unlocks is that it unlocks our path. Prayer unlocks your path. As a child, we took a lot of road trips. I don't know about you, but um, I grew up in the 1900s, and my, at the time, we didn't have GPS. And so my dad would have this fold-out atlas that would cover the entirety of the windshield of the car. And he would have his red pen circling and making, making directions and making paths. And he, he would say, first, if we hit up 95 and then hit 75 and then go all the way up to I-4 and then hook, hook left head west. I mean, if you look at it, it looks like a science experiment on that piece of paper. But the, the, the bad thing about that is, is that we would always end up lost. <laughs> We'd find ourselves in back roads, on the wrong roads. It's like, why are we driving through a neighborhood right now? <laughs> Where are we? And often my dad would stop for gas every couple of hours because we were running out of gas very quickly. And my mom, full of wisdom 
and Grace would just say, just ask the man where to go. <laughs> my parents are from the Caribbean. And um, my dad would say, no, I've got it. I know where I'm going. Don't tell me what to do. And then for a few more hours, we'd be lost. Had we only had someone tell us where to go. Had we only had a guide show us where to go. You know, today, today we, we've got technology. You know, uh, on, on an iPhone or, I'm not sure if they do it on Androids or not, but uh, definitely on an iPhone, you know, you've got navigation. I love Siri. Anybody love Siri? Oh, that's my girl. My second girl. Siri tells me everything. Siri tells me when I should leave, what the traffic is going to look like when I leave, what direction I should go, gives me alternates. I know if I got to pay a toll. I know if there's traffic here. It's, it's beautiful. And I, have, I do not ever have to be lost without Siri again if I choose to use Siri. Now, there's times where I get on the road and I don't check my phone or I get on the road and I don't map it out or I get on the road and I don't, I don't ask Siri for directions and I deal with the consequences of I-95. What, what would it look like if as a believer you had a guide? <laughs> you do. And his name is the Holy Spirit. And when we, when we encounter his presence in prayer and in worship, he unlocks our path. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says that he knows the plans that he has for you. That he will order your steps. He will make your plans succeed. He always keeps an eye on you. That's a good thing. Because we've got to go some places in this life where we need direction. And he unlocks your path. The question is, who is marking your path? Who is ordering your steps? You know, the Bible says that the steps of the righteous are ordered by the Lord. Typically, whatever gets the majority of our time has a big impact on our attention and, and especially our affection. So I would say that our decisions in life can often be traced back to the genesis of our desire. And so you crave more of what you consume. So what are you consuming today? Have, have, you ever, have you ever gone to bed and just needed a midnight snack? Have, have you ever just said like, man, that, uh, yeah, those chips are looking real good right now. I remember that mac and cheese. I just need something right now just to hold me over, just to put me down. And then it's, at the moment, it's all good. You, then you go to bed and you wake up the next morning and you're just starving. Had that, anybody show a hand? You just, your stomach is growling and you're saying, why am I so hungry? I feel like I just ate. There's a reason for that. And I, I looked it up. This is, this is what it is. This, this is no lie. Consuming foods. I looked this up on, um, I think, Wikipedia, which has got to be true. Consuming foods, especially those high in starch and sugar right before bed, causes a spike in blood sugar. Your pancreas then releases a hormone called insulin, which tells your cells to absorb blood sugar. This causes blood sugar levels to drop, leading to hunger. It's no wonder why when you do that, the path next morning leads straight to the fridge. <laughs> what if we would be a church that as we laid down, we feasted on the presence of God and the word of God? So that when we arose the next morning, his presence led us to his worship, to his word, to the hopeless, to the helpless, people that need Jesus. We need a new kind of hunger. We need a new kind of hunger. Oh, he unlocks our path. He unlocks our path. So who's directing your path? Who's ordering your steps? I pray that it's the presence of God that does that in your life. I pray it's the presence of God. The, the, the last thing, last thing it does is it unlocks peace. Prayer unlocks peace. And this might seem extremely elementary to you, but God wants you to have peace. He wants you to have peace. And man, sometimes I wish I could have had this word last year, but I got it now. And God wants you to have peace. The thing is, we know that God wants us to have peace. But it's up here. 
Sometimes it's intellectual or it's head knowledge, but we have a difficult time moving it from here to here. That knowing that deeply God wants us to have peace. I want to, I want to read uh, Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 and 7. The Bible says this, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Do not be anxious about anything. Seems highly insensitive. Birch, you don't know what I've been walking through. You don't know the pain I've experienced. You don't know what my house looks like. How can I not have anxiety? Have you seen the things that are on television? Have you seen the things that I'm, I'm having to, to walk through in my life? And I don't think God's word is telling us to be flippant or, or void or run. I just believe that our concern needs to be placed in the hands of the right person. And the, the weight of all of our pain, the weight of all our concern is not meant to squarely fall on our shoulders, but by prayer and petition to make your request known to God. I found this verse also to be helpful. First Peter chapter 5, verse 7. The Amplified Version says this, casting the whole of your care, all your anxieties, all your worries, all your concerns, once and for all on him. He cares for you and affectionately cares about you watchfully. Could it be that in 2020 you experienced a large deal of your anxiety because you were working two jobs? You were doing all that you were supposed to do, but at the same time trying to do God's job. It says the whole, the, the whole of your concerns, casting all of your cares, all your anxieties, that test, your marriage, where your kid's at right now, all of it, all of your worries, all of your concerns on the Lord because he cares for you affectionately. Here's the thing I know about our God is that he is great. He's powerful. He's strong. He's mighty. He's wise. But he's also good. He, he's patient. He's long-suffering. And so if a, if a great God wants to be good in your situation, the weight of of your concerns. His, his shoulders are square enough for it. His arms are strong enough for it. And he's inviting you to lay it down. And to lay it down once and for all. I mean, how many times have you come to an altar or gone to ask somebody to pray for you? And the moment you say amen, you pick that thing back up. That's God's job. That's God's job to, to pick that up. It's not meant for you to carry it. It was meant for you to lay it down. Not a negligent, not a careless, not a alternate reality, but casting your cares on Jesus because he cares for you. You know, one of my favorite uh, hymn writers of all time is a man named Horatio Spafford. And he lived in the 1800s, and in 1871, there was this unbelievably devastating fire in Chicago that obliterated the city. And he, as a businessman, lost everything. Could you imagine? Years later, as he's rebuilding his businesses, he's rebuilding his family, he's rebuilding his savings, he's rebuilding everything, uh, he's about to start in some new business overseas in the UK. And so while he was closing up shop, he sent his family ahead of him on a ship. And while they were on that ship, a violent storm ravaged the ocean and the ship sank, killing everyone on board except for a few. And one of the people who survived was his wife. And his wife made it to the shores of the UK, wrote a telegram back to her husband saying, I alone survived. What shall I do? His daughters was on that ship children so Horatio Spafford gets on the ship to meet his wife and 
asked the captain of the ship to stop in the place and where that ship had went down. And so he goes to the bowels of that ship and he better believe he cried. And he mourned and he wept. And he began the process of laying his burden down, square on the shoulders of Jesus. And it's there he wrote to him, it is well with my soul. And every time I sing that song, I say to myself, if the same God who can lift the burden of such tragedy was faithful to do it then, he can do it in me. If the same God who's been faithful from generation to generation never changes, then why would he stop right now? Why would he change who he is in my situation? Why would he be too weak to handle my situation, my burden? But he's not. He's strong. And I think about that song and it brings peace to my soul every time. I just think about those lyrics. When peace like a river attendeth my way when sorrows like sea billows roll, what if I'm alone? Thou hast taught me to say, It is well, it is well. My soul and my sin, oh, the bliss of his glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole. was nailed to the cross and I bear it no more praise the Lord praise the Lord oh my soul sing it as well it is well we my soul and it is well it is well with my soul love this though Satan should buffet what does buffet actually mean? But is it like a lot of food? He prepares a table in the presence of my enemy. I'm not sure what it means. But when, he, when Satan does that, or when trials should come, let this bless the assurance control oh, that Christ has regarded my head. We thank you that your word says 
the peace of God will guard our hearts and minds. It will, it will, it will like, like something that over surpasses all understanding, that kind of peace that's greater than my situation, that's greater than explanation, will guard my heart and mind in Christ Jesus. I thank you for that peace, God, that you want to bring peace to my situation right now. And so, God, right now, we, we lay it down before you. Whatever that thing is, whatever that struggle is, whatever that challenge is, whatever that burden that we've been carrying for far too long, we lay it down before you. And God, we take your peace. Come on, right now, I want you to just extend your hands like you're receiving a gift. God, we accept your peace, the peace of God that doesn't stick around for a moment and fade away, but lasts and remains. We need your peace right now, God. There's a mother in need of peace that prays every night for her child. Bring her peace, oh God. There's a student that misses his friends and is anxious about the next year. Give them your peace today, God. There's a worker not knowing if the next time they walk into the ER to serve on the front lines, if they're going to get sick. Give them your peace right now, God. That surpasses all understanding. We thank you for your peace, oh God. We thank you. And right now, with every head bowed and every eye closed in the same posture, you know, just as keys are meant to unlock things. I believe that keys also seal things. They secure things. I believe right now somebody is in need of having their eternity secured in Jesus. Somebody is in need of knowing that heaven is their home. You know, all of us, we all sin. It's not meant to condemn you. But just this, we, we missed the mark. We all fall short. If you don't believe me, think about your friends' kids. Not your kids, your friends' kids. We all fall short. But God offers us a key, and it's salvation. You know, his son, Jesus, walked this earth, perfect life, and died a death that was meant for us but didn't stay dead, rose from the grave three days later, proving that he was who he said that he was. And the Bible tells us that if we confess with our heart that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, that we will be saved. We don't have to hope. We don't have to wish. We don't have to speculate. Eternity in God's presence is yours. And in a minute, I want to lead you you in a prayer and I just want to know who I'm praying for so in just a second I want to ask you to lift up your hand I'm not going to bother you no one's going to come to you I just want to know who I'm praying with at every location I encourage you to lift your hands in just a second so we can pray together and this prayer is is not a magic trick it is you talking to God (laughs) use your key and so that's you today I also encourage you on the count of three to lift your hands all across this room and at every location. I want to know who I'm praying for. One, two, three. Come on, hands going up all across the room. I see you. Amen. I see you. Thank you. I see you. You can put them down. I know there's hands going across, going up across every location. I see them in this room. Let me lead you in this prayer. In Life Point, pray with me for the benefit of those praying it for the first time. Say, Jesus. I need you. I know that I'm a sinner, but I'm thankful you are a savior. I ask you to forgive me. I accept the key of your salvation and make you the Lord of my life. In your name we pray. Amen and amen. Come on, put your hands together, everybody. For the people making that decision for the first time. We love you, Jesus. Come on, one more time, lift up a shout of praise.
Hey, hope today's message was helpful for your life. I wanna tell you, you should subscribe. The reason why, you can get content pushed to you all the time. You don't have to wonder if you ever missed anything. And also, I want you to think about giving. By giving, you can help us take this message to so many other people that are in need of some hope, need of some encouragement, and you can be a part of making a difference in the life of so many people. Look forward to seeing you right back here next time.